to be boring. Introducing the My First Augmented Reality Workbook series from Teacher Goals and Quiver Vision. With the Quiver app, students unlock interactive experiences that teach path of motion, phonics, writing, and more. This is perfect. Would you like to find out more information on sponsoring our live stream? Email sponsorships at teachergoals.com. Our augmented reality Without further ado, are changing the way let's kids start learn, the show. Read and develop literacy skills. They'll love the interactive experiences and you'll love the results. Email us today about bulk purchases for your classroom, school, or district. Contact at teachergoals.com. My first augmented reality workbook series, Unlocking the Power of Learning. The Hitchhiker's Guide for Educators Tech Talk will begin in 24 seconds. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Teacher Goals Tech Talk Season 2, Episode 16, Exploring EduAid with co-founder Thomas Thompson, who also happens to be a social studies teacher. That's right. He's got a day job. What do you do after work? I'm Amanda Fox here with co-host Heather Brown, and we are excited you decided to hitchhike your way with us today through not only tech tools, but the pedagogy and strategies behind them. With our recent release of the AI Classroom, our next month of episodes will be completely dedicated to AI tools you can use now. So mark your calendars, Tuesdays, 7 p.m. We're going to be exploring different AI tools that you can use and integrate into your classroom curriculum. Hey, Heather, how's it going? It's a going now that I, you're on my phone instead of any of my computers. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm glad that uh, you've persevered and, and got into uh, got into the live stream. Would you like to um, introduce our guest, or would you would you like for me to bring him up? Well, I'm excited because of our book, technically your book, and um, Brad's and Dan's book that came out about AI. So I'm interested to see how this new um, program we can use as teachers, because I've heard a lot of talk about how people are so paranoid about, you know, students actually using AI to cheat. And so I think as teachers, if we see it as a useful um, platform, that we will be more understanding for what students can use it for as well. So I'm excited to welcome them on. Absolutely. Um, I think any new tech starts on the peripheral with teachers understanding, adopting before we can roll out to students. So um, Thomas Thompson, uh, he's from the Maryland Bay Area. He's on the East Coast, him and him and his co-founder. Um, we He's been kind enough to offer us time today. I'm going to go ahead and bring him up and he's going to tell us a little bit about his educational journey. So um, Thomas, uh, just give us a little bit of history about yourself and and what your journey to this point to create EduAid was like. Yeah, of course. Um, I'd like to, of course, thank you and uh, Heather for having us on the show. Really appreciate that. And a uh, thanks to um, to you again for featuring us in the AI Classroom book. Uh, yeah, my background, um, there it is. My background is in education. I've been teaching, this is my fifth year now, teaching in Maryland. I'm originally from Western Pennsylvania. I went to uh, Slippery Rock University for my undergraduate degree, secondary education, social studies. And then I'm currently at Johns Hopkins studying educational technology. Um, and I mean, if you really want to go back to ancient history, I guess it kind of starts in 11th grade. I did an English project where I got to teach the class and something about that felt felt interesting to me. It felt kind of, I don't want to say special, maybe I'm just being sentimental, right? But the idea that sharing knowledge that'll become the foundation for someone learning and for someone growing as a person and developing, and maybe that lesson that you share with them is something that they take through life and shapes who they are as a person, that felt like a truly meaningful experience. And what so, was that teacher's name? Uh, Mr. Canciello was my 11th grade um, English teacher. However, I have to give a shout out to my 11th grade social studies teacher, Mr. Claire 
he was my mentor. He taught me everything I know about education. He brought me in his classroom in 11th grade, let me uh, observe and make a lot of copies and um, take all of the materials and steal it all and take it with me. And that became the foundation for my practice. And awesome. without those two, I don't How know many- where I'd be. We, we all have our educational mentors for sure. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Ms. Shepard and, and Carol Jameson, my, my Chaucer professor, you know, my undergrad. Yes, mm-hmm. I took an entire class on Chaucer. The <laughs> um, so how many years have you been in the classroom? I was fortunate enough, like I said, to take a class my senior year that allowed me to shadow a teacher and spend an entire year in their classroom. Um, and seeing it from that angle. And then of course, um, during my undergrad, I served on a few different nonprofit organizations. One was the humanities ladder where I brought college level humanities along with a professor to um, underprivileged and under-resourced schools. So, um, you know, teaching art history in the um, kind of outskirts of the industrial area around Pittsburgh. And then um, my student teaching. And then of course, four years so far, fifth year in the classroom now, I just moved schools. I was originally in Caroline County on the Eastern shore of Maryland. And I've moved across the Chesapeake Bay to where I live in Annapolis at uh, Marley Middle School in the Anne Arundel County Public Schools, where I was today. I run the chess club. I teach seventh grade uh, world history. And uh, that's what I do during the day. I come home at night and this is what I work on. Shout out to the middle school teachers out there. I was a middle school teacher. And um, bless that you was, all. It's, <laughs> that, it's that a was, wonderful age. That was my that was my love. I've taught them, I've taught it all. But like middle schoolers, they're they're they still want you to hold their hand and they want mm-hmm. your approval. And but they still laugh at your jokes. Like <laughs> they're starting to get that independence, but like we're still funny. So yeah. It's very nice. So, they're they're right on the precipice, right? And and you taught today until 4:30. Yes. Well, yes. four o'clock, four o'clock. Um, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. so I wasn't joking. Um, this is this is like very impressive uh, that, that you've started this, you know, and you're after a full day of teaching, like you've been able to ha- have the time, dedication and put in the sweat mm-hmm. equity of, of building a startup. So can you kind of tell me where that idea came from? But guys, we are going to jump into the platform. We're going to do a demo. But um, every great uh, every great start to a startup or start or company has a great origin story. So we're going to kind of delve into the origin before we delve into the the tech tool. Well, I guess it would have started in Caroline County, Maryland, the first school I actually held as a professional teacher, the first school I worked in. Um, right next to me um, was another guy named Thomas. Uh, he grew up uh, not more than 20 minutes from where I grew up. We never once crossed paths. And um he taught science. His name was Thomas Hummel. He's a co-founder of this company along with Tyler Como. Um, And we shared a lot of conversations after work, during work, during our plannings, you know, collaborating, thinking, kind of hitting our head off the whiteboard and wondering, you know, what could we do to be better at our jobs? What could we do to improve the space? Um, You know, what, because we felt like there were issues in public education, uh, many. I don't want to generalize the issues, but there were a few that stuck out to us. You know, I, I replaced a teacher who was only there for two years, who replaced a teacher who was only there for a few years before that. And when you have high teacher attrition and, you know, it takes a few years to attain kind of expertise and mastery in the field and to become a, a qualified and expert teacher. And if you have high turnover, you're kind of having a gap to where that that's not really, you have a lot of teachers in the developmental phase, but you need to get more across the threshold to be the expert teacher that can truly make a difference, that has that technological, pedagogical content knowledge, but also knows how to make the relationships and has all the soft skills that only comes with experience that you can't get from sitting in a um, methods course or what it, what it might be. And um, originally, I thought, a part of that solution would be sharing as many resources as possible, open educational resources, open sharing between teachers, free collaboration, um, revision, remixing, uh, repurposing and redistributing. That's what my uh, master's thesis is on, the role of open educational resources in teacher planning. Uh, But that ended up not being the idea because we saw emerging technologies, one of them being uh, artificial intelligence. And specifically, we saw a lot of what ChatGPT was returning. And of course, there were the um, 
the the nervous tweets coming out about students are cheating on chat GPT and this is going to be the death of education and what are we ever going to do? And I said, Hummel came to me, Thomas, um, and he said that he and a friend Tyler were thinking about how to harness chat GPT in a way that would be not so much pitting the teacher in competition with artificial intelligence, but enabling teachers to collaborate with artificial intelligence to communicate um, sorry, not communicate, collaborate and um, complement each other. And from there, uh, we began developing what became Eduade, a platform where teachers can build generative educational resources. Um, those are educational resources made in collaboration with an artificial intelligence, not by an artificial intelligence, but in collaboration. That's the that's really at the foundation of what we're doing. How can we give creativity? back to teachers? How can we free up teachers' times? Because I see too many of my coworkers going home with stacks of paper under their arms. And while I think there is a certain merit to, you know, drinking a cup of coffee and really immersing yourself in your work and having, you know, one of those long nights and it, you know, any creative will tell you that's what they enjoy doing. Uh, but it's also a career and um, you can't expect people with families to go home every single night and, you know, just do a lot of work that could be done at work. So we understood that we couldn't stretch teacher planning time. So how could we make teacher planning time far more efficient? How could we make teachers far more efficient, exponentially so, so that they can, you know, have the time to be creative, have the time to truly personalize and differentiate lessons to fit their students' needs? Because as we saw it, we had a lot of teachers that we worked with who were spending a lot of their time planning finding lessons, finding materials, putting together a bunch of different resources and kind of coming up with this hodgepodge mix of things that they've cobbled together and then bringing that to the class. And it's kind of a one size fits all industrial model. You get what I have because this is all I had time to pull together. And we thought there has to be a better way than that. There has to be a better way than going to 30 different sites to find one resource. There has to be a way where we can harness the power of a large language model, uh, an artificial intelligence to help us pull together resources more efficiently and more effectively. And I think that's what we've done with EduAid. Absolutely. And um, just kind of hammering on your point of, of allowing teachers to be more creative. I know I've spent so much time um, building in um, MTSS, multi-tiered instruction and, and hitting mm -hmm. on differentiation and making sure all of that's reflected in a lesson plan with the learning objectives mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. and, and that takes time. And at the end of that, you don't, as a teacher, you don't, because you, you're, you've checked your boxes, you've turned in what's asked of you to show that you know how, we don't have the time to actually follow through with our creative, like this video game unit that I was creating, mm -hmm. there's so many hours in a day, yeah. and at the end of the day, it just didn't get to where I wanted it to be, so I rolled it out as is, whereas if I would have, if I would have had this last year in the classroom, mm -hmm. I would have been so much more efficient. So um, I, um, I appreciate your contributions to, you know, helping teachers and reducing that workload. And I, I tell Ed, when I'm talking at a conference or um, doing a podcast, um, the big thing that teachers are saying now is AI won't replace you, but an AI using teacher will. That's not necessarily true either. And if that doesn't motivate you, mm -hmm. the AI using teacher is going to have an hour or two more time with their family that night than you are because you know, you've, you've kind of shunned the technology or haven't really learned how to leverage it in a way that makes you more efficient and, and the things that are required of you. Well, that's really the thing. And I totally understand where you're coming from. I am in a co-taught class. I Thank have you, to, Chipper Weaver. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. I <laughs> have to differentiate instruction to meet the needs of um, my diverse learners. And of course, I have students with IEP requirements that I have to meet and differentiating instruction for my English language learners, for my students who are excelling at a much higher rate, my gifted and talented students. So I have to kind of tier it and meet all of the students instead of just going to the middle and hoping I'm picking up on either side. And um to the point of the AI using teacher, the uh, chess player, Gary Kasparov, he, uh, one of the greatest chess players of all time. I'm sorry, I'm a chess nerd. I run the chess club <laughs> at our school. Um, he played um, IBM's uh, Deep Blue back in the 90s. And, and you appreciated the chess intro in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Into the, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, he toyed with this notion for a while of the... Um, 
computer assisted chess player as opposed to just the chess player by themselves playing the computer because he said the person's going to lose every time. So maybe a computer with a human would be better. Now, eventually he abandoned that idea. Um, but what I will say about it, that I think there is some merit to it, is the game of chess has... The average player has grown exponentially since the introduction of AI. We learned how to play the game much better by learning from artificial intelligence playing each other, these different chess bots all playing each other. And I think the same may be true with teachers working with, collaborating with artificial intelligence, but also teachers who work with artificial intelligence collaborating with each other and then collaborating with the other teachers who do not use artificial intelligence. So I think, um, I think our system does a way, uh, um, provides a way of bridging this gap. Yes, and like for me, I'm the only person who teaches what I teach in my building. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have that, that co-teacher or the person to collaborate with. So mm -hmm. I can share my ideas with the AI and say, can you build upon this? And it's like having a collaborator mm -hmm. when I wouldn't normally have one. Exactly. And then what the AI gives you, you can build upon that and then mm -hmm. go back to the AI and say, hey, what do you think of this? And then build upon this. And it's this, uh, this exponential growth of what you can create in the classroom working with an artificial intelligence. Yeah, uh, Patricia just said 60 Minutes just had a segment last week um, about chess playing bots. So a timely conversation. Yes. Um, so do you want to let's let's go ahead and actually dig into eduay.ai. And um, as as I'm pulling it up, if you want to kind of tell people like when you started it um, mm -hmm. and when it I know it it just came out of beta or just went into beta. Uh, yeah, this has been a um, just a few months in progress this year. 2023 is when we uh, started. So when a teacher goes to the site, they would first be welcomed by uh, this. This is our homepage, of course. And uh, the beta is freely accessible to any teacher who wants to give it a try. All you need to do is type in your email. We send you a link and you're in. It's a very simple process to make an account and give it a test for yourself. Um, we're always taking feedback from teachers, trying to improve this as much as we can, trying to shape this around the experience of our users who are, of course, teachers. So once you launch our app, you are met with this page here. This is our teaching assistant. As you will see on the left-hand side, we have an assistant, a content generator, a community, which is in development, and then a place where you can save your content. I'm going to break this demo into two parts. I think that would be the best way to handle it. I want to first give you an idea of the layout and of the tools and what this can do. And then I want to present some problems and uh, kind of flex the muscles of the system, so to speak, to show you um, well, to show you the range of affordances of this technology. So I'm a middle school social studies teacher. So if you could excuse the middle school social studies examples, I also um, will explore all the other ones um, wherever people are interested, of course. If but, anyone um, has any lesson, um, lesson recommendations or requests, you can drop them in the comments and um, maybe Thomas will humor humor you oh. and use your your content as an example i have to say i used it to figure out a um real life example of a high school math standard today mm -hmm. holy cow it was awesome because i honestly don't remember learning that standard in high school so i needed some help and it was awesome yeah, we were really excited about the um, the math sections, real world examples. Um, that was Thomas Hummel's idea. He um, was always thinking, he's like, what's the one question I always asked when I was in math class? Because he said he would, he'll tell you he wasn't the, the best student looking back as a teacher. And he said, I would always ask, when am I ever going to use this? And that's a question I hear math teachers getting all the time. And I think this um, that tool right there would help. But anyway, we uh, launch with the uh, teaching assistant, which is kind of a broad area where all teachers, regardless of content area, could probably find some value. Um, we all have to come up with lesson plans, develop units, make announcements to our class, draft emails for sensitive topics home and um, or praiseworthy emails at home. But those ones always feel easy. And then, of course, uh, leave plans for our substitute teachers. Uh, the lesson plan is not so much a lesson plan, so to speak. It's a lesson seed in that it provides a range of options for a teacher, a uh, range of possibilities for them to build off of. We wanted to be conscious of the fact that it needs to be modular enough to fit into existing curriculum, but large enough to provide value. 
So again, I'm a middle school social studies teacher. So let's go to middle school and I teach world history. So we're doing a unit on world religions and one of the world religions is Buddhism. So let's take a look at that. We'll go with the creation and development of Buddhism as a lesson seed. And again, this isn't going to provide a full plan as much as it is going to provide a range of options and ideas. You click add to workspace and then the language model populates the workspace with our lesson seed. Now, as you can see, you can watch the text, you can watch the magic happen. We were really excited about that. But um, one thing is it's kind of a block of text, right? That's, that's a daunting thing, but it's also a conscious decision. We don't want to make this product something that a teacher would hop on and just copy and paste and throw it into a worksheet somewhere or a Google Doc and export it. Rather, we want to encourage a teacher to work with this, to shape it, to fit their unique classroom needs, to differentiate the instruction and personalize the materials. So we have our lesson plan here, the creation and development of Buddhism. And what it provides us always, anyone that generates will get these things, provides you with an objective. Students will be able to understand the basic principles of Buddhism, its history, and how it has developed throughout the years. Now, I will admit that is a pretty broad, pretty big lesson. But again, this is something I could break down into pieces, and we encourage that. This is not a final product. This is something that you, as the teacher, can shape. Because while the large language model, because while the AI is great at doing this, these big things, cobbling together all the activities from the data that it's been trained on, it doesn't know your classroom like you do. You know your students. You know what piques their interest, what gets them thinking, and what's going to make them maybe turn to distractions. So it's up to you to play with this. And what we have here are a range of teaching strategies that you could use. Now, it provides us, of course, with some direct instruction, the teacher providing a brief history of Buddhism and its key principles using visual aids, such as slides and diagrams, all things that Eduate as a tool can help you construct. I'm talking about facilitating group discussions, allowing students to construct knowledge through interactions and um, social collaboration. And, and then, of I, course, oh, I yes. love just to interrupt you. I've played around with this a lot, and every I've, every generation gives the teaching strategies. It has the lecture, the group discussions, all the components that you would mm -hmm. find. And um, again, this is a, a springboard. It's a launch pad. So um, this this could be a multi day lesson, or you could you could do it in a day. So it's just how you kind of uh, decide to integrate it into your practices. We did have a a, a comment. Yes. Um, Tripper, he said he didn't have cell phones or laptops growing up. Now we're talking about AI. Um, aren't you uh, afraid that this modern tech is going to take your jobs? I mean, in my opinion, some of this modern day stuff is taking jobs away. Um, my, res my response to that is photographies, like when the camera came out, uh, there was a lot of backlash on that. People saying it wasn't art. When the calculator and computers came out, there were fear that these would take jobs. Um, so every time something new comes out, it, it will replace some jobs, but it will also create new jobs. So... And, and make us more efficient at what we're doing. So that's that's just my take on it, just just kind of fielding some of the comments here. Um, one other person said, this sounds great. They're about to have a tech coach meeting in Albany, New York, and um, she's going to be sharing it. Um, they appreciate the time that you put into to, to developing this. So, oh, and they're, they're enjoying the AI classroom. Thank you. Um, and then John Wick says, thank you for encouraging teachers to be the professionals and experts they are, using their expertise to tailor the output to their unique class. All right, continue. Sorry. Just just wanted to. Yes, pull of course. Measures. And I think um, to the first um, comment about the concerns, uh, I think teachers are right to be skeptical and perhaps even to be a little nervous. This is a new technology and its effects we do not know. It will change the way we teach. It certainly will. But I don't think it's necessarily a point to fear as much as it is one for us to prepare and to do it properly. Uh, we, every technology has its affordances, barriers, and trade-offs. Nothing is going to be a panacea. Nothing is going to solve our problems. It's going to have to be something that we work with, compromise. And I think it will create opportunities that we do not yet see because we learn in relation to what we know, as Vygotsky might say. And that, I mean, we don't know what the effect and jobs that are possible with AI are. 
But I do know that it can help us currently in um, planning and developing our lessons and not so much teaching the class. Because as I said, the AI is great at the big stuff. It can pull together many, many, many resources. But it's not great at the small intuitive shifts that you as a teacher can do very, very well. And that was, um, going back to the chess example, that was Gary Kasparov's idea that humans can make the intuitive small changes that it's really hard for an AI to do because it takes a long time and a lot of data to learn and change course. But anyway, I won't walk through all of these uh, areas. I just kind of want to give a big uh, summary of them and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper into what we can do here. Uh, this um, lesson question, oh, can yes. you use this for theology or religious education across diverse denominations? So the artificial intelligence, the large language model that this is built on is uh, OpenAI's GPT 3.5. And that uh, system is trained on massive amounts of data all across the internet. So there are, um, there's a lot of information out there about um, religion and theology across diverse de denominations. So I would say, yes, the, um, I've done lessons on, again, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Shintoism, but also other um, philosophies like Confucianism and Stoicism. And um, again, a religion on uh, a lesson on the religion of Islam and of Christianity, and it handled them well. And one thing I will note as a, a credit to the artificial intelligence is that it does a great job of providing context. And you will see that come up in a few moments here. Um, so it will also provide us with a range of cue sets, mm -hmm. uh, questions that we can um, pose to our students to get them thinking, the warm up, so to speak, for the lesson, a range of activities, assignment types, and then, of course, our closing question, our um, exit ticket to track student mastery of the objective that we laid out. Um, one thing here, a uh, mindfulness exercise, right? Students will practice mindfulness by focusing on their breath and being aware of their surroundings. It goes beyond what we would traditionally think has a place in the classroom, but I have certainly seen more um, mindfulness and social emotional learning um, lessons come to, come to the fore in the classroom. So I'm pretty happy with this uh, lesson seed. So I'm going to save it, right? I'll title it uh, the developments, the creation and development of Buddhism. And I will save it. And when I save it, you'll see a little pop-up comes up, tells you that the content has successfully saved. And now I think I can show you where your stored content goes. On the left-hand bar here, it's all in one place. That was really big for us as well, making sure that teachers have one workspace to do the job instead of having to jump between multiple things. You know, I've had Google Translate, um, Newzella, and... Uh, DBQ all pulled up in three different tabs on three different screens, and it can be a little daunting. But here, I can have one workspace. And here's my lesson plan, the creation and development of Buddhism. We have a preview button, so you can pop in and say, oh, it's right here. Terrific. You can organize this all by classes. I have one class currently, a social studies class. That is the class that I put my um, work in when I create it. Um, I really tried to put my money where my mouth is. And for my observation lesson, I used exclusively eduaid materials to do it but let's create a new class just so you can see what that looks like and we'll call that the um, teacher goals demo nice teacher goals demo class there we go i'll add the class to my workload i'll add a description uh, today's date is the 18th 04 18 i'll just throw the date in as our description there we are class created successfully Great, so let me move some classes around. I can pop it into my teacher goals demo, into my social studies class. Let's put it into the teacher goals demo. And um, you can navigate your classes as such. And there you go, there it is. You click on it and you can put it into your workspace. You can move the class around. You can create copies, which will become um, a great tool in just a moment, as you'll see. In my social studies class, like I said, I did a lesson on Buddhism and I created a secondary source article with some questions. I have my subject headings, the creation of Buddhism. I have my text chunked in various ways. I have some keywords for students who may struggle with some of the jargon. Of course, my multiple choice reading comprehension questions and some short answer questions. And what I like about this is it's not so large that it 
becomes a thing that stands alone. It's small enough. It's like I said, modular that it can fit into standing existing curriculum and align itself to um, standards and school wide objectives. And what I did here is I exported this to a Google doc where I was able to insert some static elements that I like to use. Like for example, I have a markup the text procedure that I have students do where they underline main ideas and write some comments and questions about the text. So I have a little thing that I'm able to insert there. And again, this is all about teachers having total and complete granular control. But let's, let's look closely at this. How did I get to this point with this reading comprehension lesson? And to that, to answer that question, we'll have to jump over to our content generator. So let me reset the workspace, completely clean it, and let's create something new. Let's show you how we got there. So when you click content generator, you'll be met with a few different prompts. And uh, these prompts will really help specify the range that the AI can generate in so that it returns reliable, high quality educational materials. It kind of filters it down. Yes, exactly. It uh, filters it down, specifies, and the prompts are structured in such a way, again, as to return as close as we can get reliable educational resources time after time, generation after generation. And so, like with chat GPT, they're mm -hmm. starting completely from scratch. You've already built in some of the drop down prompt parameters for teachers. Exactly. So we've done a lot of experimenting with a lot of the prompts because chat GPT, while it does solve the, the blinking cursor problem of, oh, I have to type out something and I don't know what to do. But in a way, it's also daunting because there's nothing there. There's no guardrails. There's nothing there to kind of guide you. It's just you and the cursor, and you have to put your ideas in a way that will jive with the language model. What we have done is we've taken a little bit of that and narrowed it down. We've created a set of prompts and parameters that will, again, better align what ChatGPT does, but it will align it more to learning um, what we know about methods of instruction and uh, the science of learning. Again, it's modular enough to be changed, to be fixed, to be placed into curriculum. So I'm going to do a secondary source reading comprehension um, assignment, and I'll do it for middle school, grades six through eight. And again, we're learning about the creation and development of Buddhism. I hit add to workspace, and it'll begin to generate this secondary source article. It'll give us an outline of the creation of Buddhism. You know, Buddhism is one of the world's major religions that originated in ancient India. It was founded by a man named Siddhartha Gautama, who later became known as the Buddha. I won't read the whole article, of course. But as it generates, again, this is this block of text. And this is a conscious decision. We want this to be something where the teacher is actually going to read through it and say, okay, I, I have this. The, the How do I break it up? So as, of course, the teacher finds the paragraph breaks and looks at the sections and figures out how to properly chunk it for the students, right? I might go with, just call this broadly, the creation of Buddhism. And then I see that this is a large section on the middle way and the four noble truths. So maybe we'll go um, the central teachings of Buddhism. And comments here. And then, of course, um, we have the basis for a secondary source article, but it's not the full thing, because if it was the full thing, then this would just be the AI doing the work. And that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the teacher to, again, personalize this, shape it down. Uh, on our homepage, we have kind of a, a mantra for our workflow, which is source it, shape it, share it. The idea being that you source the, the raw materials to make a lesson and you shape it to something useful for your class. And then of course you share it with your students and share it to the community where other teachers can then take those lessons and personalize them even further. But all right, there's a lot of jargon in here, the middle way, the eightfold path. If you don't know a lot about Buddhism, this could be a little daunting. So you right click the highlighted text and we have a range of tools and this is going to be an ever expanding list of tools for teachers again to engage in that personalization. So I want to extract some keywords for my students, the high impact words that are going to pop up a bunch. They might even be on the exam and they need to know the definitions. So I hit extract keywords and down at the bottom, it gives us a glossary of all of the, again, the high impact words all throughout the text. Buddhism with a definition of what it is and basis, 
Siddhartha Gautama, who he was, the Four Noble Truths, what they are, the Middle Way, what that is, and the Eightfold Path, what that means. And what we can do from here is further develop. So we take this, I go, okay, great. I'm going to, maybe I don't need a keywords right now, or maybe, you know what, I changed my mind. I'll throw them down here a little bit further. I'll type in keywords. I'll make a section out of it. A little highlight and underline. Terrific. And then I'm going to take these questions and I want to insert those below the keywords. Let the students get the full range of what we're talking about here. And then I'll put my short answer questions in. Well, let me save this, right? So I have the basis of an article. I have the basis of a reading comprehension assignment. But there's we're not done yet. There's going to be a lot more to add to it. So again, we'll call that the creation and development of Buddhism. And I'll save that, specify that it's my gen ed copy. And I'll save it. Great. I want more than short answer questions, however. Maybe I want to give my students some options. So what I can do instead of um, thinking out how can I turn these into multiple choice questions, uh, we have a tool for that. So let me take the text because I want the multiple choice questions to be based on the text. I copied my text over and I popped it over into the topic bar. And uh, again, we have some uh, various tabs here. We have our question for multiple choice questions. I'll click that, add to workspace, and now we will generate a range of multiple choice questions tailored directly to that text, pulled out from the text. Um, so Patricia just asked, can you say paste the standard instead of a title? You absolutely can. You can mm -hmm. paste the standard. You can paste learning objectives if you have those, because I know a lot of us are working from a prescribed curriculum. We follow um, Common Core or NGSS. So um, as as you're developing these, you can absolutely take what you're already working with, what your curriculum is, and it will customize it for you. And that's actually part two of our demo. We're going to make a science model based directly on a standard. I don't know which standard we're going to use, but I have a tab open for the Maryland science standards. Um, we could jump to that right now if you'd like. Um, sure. Um, I, I do also want to hit, um, you've got a mindfulness and SEL section. Yes. So I, I find fascinating. And, um, I want, I want the educators who are viewing and those, those who will be later to be aware of that feature mm -hmm. and, um, and, and understand how to use that to create moments for students that, you know, because sometimes we're not teaching just the curriculum, we're teaching the whole child. So SEL matters. Exactly. And uh, to that point, let me jump over real quick to the uh, oh, lesson um, I saved. Lori and... just said, will it differentiate? So I want to get to that. The um, piece of differentiation, I would say we trust to the professional, but we want to provide tools for teachers to do that. And one of those will be that we can actually scale the Lexile level of the text so let me show you how that works. Maybe I want to decrease the difficulty of this text by one level. So what that's going to do is it's going to, of course, shorten the sentences, shorten the paragraphs. It's going to provide me with some topic headings. And it's going to take what was previously one or two really long paragraphs and drop it down into something shorter, into something more digestible. And of course, you can do that more and more. You can keep decreasing the uh, difficulty or increasing the difficulty. And that's the also... situation right there for our, our struggling readers so or our ESL students. So, mm -hmm. But in, in addition, we also have the ability to say, let's take this paragraph here, and we can translate it right in the workspace. So we'll translate it right over to Spanish. And now I have a Spanish copy in the exact mm -hmm. same workspace. The way I handle that is I'll usually um, save my gen ed copy into my workspace. I will hit make a copy. Okay, John copy just said it, he, he loves that you have the Leslie scaling. Um, and he asked, will it provide information on the Lexile level being used when you adjust? He said exile, but I, I know he meant Lexile. So we um, have mapped this on to, um, we did a little looking into um, Lexile.com and we matched it onto their um, scale. However, we don't have it tailored yet to give you the Lexile level, 
but since you gave that feedback, that is something that we will have up very soon. Um, it's not there, too, there you go. Feedback. It's not um it's not the most complicated thing to have it say what the Lexile level is at the beginning. So that is certainly a feature that we can add. And we try to be as open and responsive to our users as possible. Because again, I'm a teacher, my other co-founder, Thomas, he's a teacher, and we want to make this as useful for teachers as possible. Yes. As an interventionist, that would be ex especially helpful. All right. Well, that's, I'm writing it down now. See, I'm learning from this. This is terrific. <laughs> Exile awesome. If anyone else has any feedback that they'd like to drop in the comments, something that they would want to see. Um, I love how uh, reflexive you are and reactive you are to, to feedback that comes in. Oh, so um, as you guys explore, they are eduaid.ai on Twitter. Uh, drop them a line, tweet at them, tell them what you love, tell them what you want to see. Yeah, and we will certainly take that and act on it very quickly. We try to be, like I said, very flexible. Um, to wrap up what we were doing with the uh, first part of the demo, I can make a copy of a lesson, hop into that copy, translate it. Now I have my EL version. I can scale that up and down. I can, in the content generator, I can go ahead and add additional extension questions. I can do some taxonomy scaffolding. Uh, that's a pretty interesting one. You put in maybe a, um, again, let's do Looking so at, we've got, uh, what about the option to add depth and complexity prompts? And then will there be accessibility features? I think I think actually being able to increase and decrease the difficulty of the text, chunking it, and mm -hmm. the translation feature are all accessibility features. So um, when, you, when you say accessibility, Lori, what are you thinking? Um, can you kind of elaborate of, of what, you, what you want to see? Sorry, go ahead. No, no worries. These are all great comments and things that, again, I'm taking down in my notes. So um, we mentioned doing Buddhism, and part of that was, they said, do a meditation activity. Well, under the wellness section of our assistant, we have some of these activities that help us form these connections with students that go beyond the instructional, learning about who our kids are and um, you know what they think about not so much what they think about the content and what they think about knowledge, but what they think about life and living. And a part of that, of course, are our social emotional learning activities. Students can learn on a variety of topics, examples, of course, being kindness or bullying or community or whatever the um, school is targeting in these. Um, in, for example, in my school, we, during our home rooms, have a social emotional learning lesson um, for the students. And unfortunately, what I've seen in a lot of schools is they don't provide much guidance in the way they want you to approach that. They'll kind of say, hey, we have some social emotional learning goals. Let's see what you can do about it. This is a tool to help you do that. But let's when go to I, the mindfulness. When app. I taught middle school, we had that 30 minute homeroom block and we were supposed to be doing SEL or um, it, mm -hmm. it never happened. So um, having having this as a a place to go that scaffolds faculty, scaffolds, you know, teachers. I think it's fantastic. So what does, these, it, does it read the text? A text-to-speech option. Um, we currently do not offer a text-to-speech option, but that is certainly something we can look into adding. Awesome. Mindfulness activity. So um, a part of that is uh, Zen Buddhism. Let me add a Great topic. Here's a five minute Zen, Zen mindfulness activity with a script for the leader. So it provides you with a script for your students to conduct this mindfulness activity that we mentioned back in the lesson plan, right? Um, welcome to the Zen mindfulness activity. It gives you kind of the background of what it is and what the posture is, and then guides the students through it with directions, you know, um, Bring your attention to your breath. Focus on the sensation of the air moving in and out of your nostrils. Notice the feeling of your chest rising and falling with each breath. As someone who has done a guided meditation or two, this is pretty close to what I hear on most of those. But let's um, let's jump into the, the problems that we were getting to. So for that, I want to go back to the content generator, and we'll go to science. And I'm going to share a... Um, Second tab, which is the na next generation science standards for states by states. So let's look at some Maryland science standards. Uh, my co-founder is a middle school social, um, science teacher. Um, let's just go broad discipline, earth and space sciences. I'm fascinated by astronomy. Let's hit submit. Okay, we get a few standards back. Earth's place in the universe. That seems pretty interesting. I like contemplating where we are in the grand cosmic scale. 
develop and use a model to describe the role of gravity and the motions within galaxies and the solar system. That certainly seems like an interesting standard to me. Let's go back to Eduade. I'm going to go to science and, um, well, what do you know? We actually have an option to develop a model. And let's put that standard right in there. Describe the role of gravity and the motions within galaxies in the solar system. Let me add that to the workspace. And what it gives us is a procedure for building a model of gravity in the solar system and galaxies. It gives us the materials that we would need. It kind of gives us the procedure for doing it the assembling of the planets, and then step three to actually create the model. But in addition to that, it provides us with some extension activities. And oftentimes it'll give us some context about, okay, well, first you might need to do a lesson on what gravity is, for example, or how gravity affects the solar system or how gravity keeps planets in their, um, in their proper orbits. And for that, of course, you can Go through a range of reading comprehension assignments, which will provide an article for students. We can generate outlines of essays, which I find to be a terrific aid for note taking and that it gives you topic headings, uh, mock studies to um, students to evaluate and challenge and find evidence to support claims or team based activities, multiple choice questions, extension questions, a variety of things you can do. So this is where we kind of get to like flex the muscles a little bit of what the system's capable of. So not only does it give us possible extension activities for the assignment, but we also have the tools to go ahead and actually implement these extension activities. So model different types of galaxies. That's, we're getting much deeper, right? We're looking at spiral and elliptical and irregular galaxies. And all right, well, maybe I want my students, how do I know they truly understand this standard? Well, we can look at a level of um, scaffolding of different um, hierarchies of learning. So we have re a remembering um, level or the understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating level. This, of course, seems to be modeled on Bloom's taxonomy. And um, all right, evaluating. How does the interaction of gravity with other fundamental forces shape the structure of galaxies in the solar system? Maybe you really like that as your um, essential question for class. You can then start structuring lessons around that. Maybe I want to add a, a discussion prompt on top of this, and that'll generate right in the workspace. So now I have some big discussion questions that I can ask my students about this topic. And maybe I think one of the questions is a little... Um, is a little tough for students to have open-ended. Well, I can take it and uh, we can go ahead and do a follow-up question about it, kind of provide a, a one-two. So I learn a little bit about it. All right, it provides me with some scenarios that actually kind of provide an example of how this question would function in an environment. A group of astronomers observe newly formed galaxies, notice that its spiral arms are not as tightly wound as other galaxies. They make a hypothesis. What observations would they need to make to support this hypothesis? Because we built this on top of an evaluating question, which then created questions that would lead students to that level, which then gave scenarios in which that level is in play. So you can constantly stack and build and add, take away, remix, remodel, um, revise, and really get what you need to, again, be creative, to have flexibility, to say, okay, this is pretty interesting. So how do I find some, say, reliable resources that I'd want to take into the classroom to um, demonstrate these? Well, that takes me back to the assistant. And here we go. We have a credible source list. It'll generate a list of five widely accepted sources on a specific topic. And they're actual sources with mm -hmm. links. So we have a space.com article. We have a How Gravity Works article um, that takes us right to a site from NASA. I can um, copy that link. But let's reiterate that the teacher should always vet these. Um, yes, it's training it back, we'll definitely read them. And, but the fact that it's generating sources with actual links that are, aren't broken, that are, are real and not fictional is amazing. 
And then it kind of will give you context as to what some of these uh, sources do, right? This article from Forbes explains how the weak force, which is responsible for radioactive decay and other processes, plays a role in shaping the universe. So it gives you context. And that's something I really want to reiterate a lot. The AI does a terrific job of providing context to things that maybe have some, I don't want to use the word controversial, but things that maybe, you know, the school's not out on it yet. We're not exactly sure where we stand. Our public consensus maybe isn't there. It does a good job of saying, you know, there is disagreement on this and there are different opinions on how certain things may be. Perceived. It's almost like a sentiment analysis. It does its own sentiment analysis to a degree. Exactly. So we, we're about out of time. If you had one more thing you wanted to show, what would it be? If I had one more thing I wanted to show, what would it yeah. be? I'll show you the thing that I was most skeptical of at first. And that is the email home. Because I know that teachers have to, you know, write emails and it's not exactly their favorite thing to do. It's not exactly their favorite thing to do. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but it's something that needs to be done by the teacher. And what we've wanted to do is providing a, a tactful outline for how this email could be structured. So you take a sensitive topic that you need to cover um, and it'll provide an outline of the topics that you want to hit and the maybe the major points you want to make that will also do a good job of detecting your tone. And because unfortunately, maybe after a long day of work, we're a little out of patience and maybe we come across in a way that- That's Short and snappy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this will provide something that isn't so short and snappy about- um, well, I mean, we can open that up to the, um, viewers if they have something they would like me to generate for the email home. Um, maybe any kind of topic that they struggled with. Um, I don't want to make it look scripted. I want to show you what this thing can truly do under a lot of different circumstances. No, Eduaid is completely um, free. We're in beta. You can sign up now. I'm just responding to one of the comments there. Yep. Yeah, totally, oh, totally open, totally yeah. free. Um, one asked, um, "Does wait, wait? Uh, can you do this demonstration for other groups?" So yes. I've been telling people reach out to Thomas on Twitter. He's at eduaid.ai. If you have an email, I can drop that in the comments too. Yeah. Uh, let me up. Yeah, Thompson T. You can just email me directly. Uh, Thompson T. T H O M P S O N T zero nine two six at Gmail. All right. And then just to uh, demonstrate, I mean, maybe it was something unfortunate. This was a thing that I unfortunately had to deal with in class a couple uh, weeks ago. A student was um, how do I put it? Inebriated at at school. So you have to send an email home for that. Well, that's going to be a phone call, but maybe I'm also sending an email. Um, it's the warning. It's the warning email that the phone call is coming. Yes, your student was inebriated. Boy, I am a uh, social studies teacher, not an English teacher. So thank God we have spell check in the world, right? <laughs> inebriated. Your student was inebriated in class. That's a tough email to send. You got the blank cursor problem really going. So what this will provide is it's going to give us a subject. I hope this email finds you in good health and high spirits, right? It's a, it's a little energetic there, but I am writing to you to express my concerns regarding your student's behavior in class. Again, I didn't use a name here because I don't have one. Recently, I've noticed that so-and-so, insert name, has been coming to class in an inebriated state, which is worrying. Again, it's put inebriated because I put inebriated. Maybe I would simplify the language of he was drunk in class or something like that. As a student, I understand that students in grades 11 to 12 are at an age where they may experiment with alcohol or other substances, but it is important to know that these or this could interfere with their education, of course. It's providing a kind of a tactful response for you to say, all right, I'm going to edit this down. And then I'm going to call. make it more personable, but at least I have something. I'm not looking at the blank screen not saying, from scratch. saying what am I going to write? How am I going to handle like, Holy this? Holy crap, how do I even start with this? <laughs> so the way we have approached AI at Eduate is that we look at it like a sculptor may look at a block of marble. It's not the finished product. I have to sculpt it away. I have to make it into something. I have to shape it to the work of art because the marble may be of high quality, but, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that the sculptor takes that marble and puts it into something truly useful. And Beautiful. that's what I hope we can do here.
That's All what right. I hope you can do with it. Patricia says, uh, Patricia says, um, I, I leave that to the admins. <laughs> um, <laughs> Facebook user says awesome presentation. Um, and that kind of, that brings us to a close. Um, if there's one piece of advice that you would like to leave teachers the, or our viewers with, what would it be before we call it, uh, call it a show? That trust that you're an expert, understand that you've put in years to get to where you're at, but also know that just because you're an expert doesn't mean that you have to stop learning either. And in education, we constantly have to evolve. We constantly have to grow and we constantly have to meet our students where they are at. And with that, I think, you know, you don't have to take everything so, so seriously. You can take a step back and enjoy the moment and go, wow, I'm working with kids and shaping the way they're going to think for years to come. And just take that deep breath and approach things with a sense of humility, some perspective. That is great advice. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank, thank all of my viewers for joining us as well. Um, we are uh, hitting hitting the podcast hot and heavy for the next uh, two months. We've got a lot of AI tools that we'll be bringing to you. And, um, oh, I, I think you have a friend on, y Yolanda Holloway. Great advice. She was my principal. Thank you so oh. much for watching, Yolanda. That's awesome. Yeah, she's been commenting. So it's, it's always great to have uh, previous admins that support us and and um, I know a lot of my previous admins have become friends and we, we keep in touch. And But um, thank you guys. Um, tune in next Tuesday at uh, seven o'clock. We actually have a special episode with Quiver Vision and we're going to be talking about augmented reality work workbooks and integrating AR into literacy to keep kids coming back for more. Um, that's a wrap and we'll see you next time. Courses by Teacher Goals. Register now for the Canva Classroom.